Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this event titled LAC 2024, The Stories We'll Likely Be Talking About. I'm Jason Marzak, Vice President and Senior Director of the Asian Arts Latin America Center here at the Atlantic Council. Earlier this month, we published our annual predictions on the 10 issues that could shape Latin America and the Caribbean in 2024. Questions ranging from, will now President Arevalo in Guatemala succeed in reducing corruption? To, will more regional countries sign on to China's Belt and Road Initiative? And everything else in between. Today, we're here to further unpack what might be in store for this highly consequential year of 2024. Like millions of citizens, analysts, public private sector leaders, we're gonna be closely watching the six presidential elections taking place this year. The first measures of recently inaugurated administrations, Brazil's presidency of the G20, and the list goes on, both in the known, but also the unknown. What else might be on the agenda? And also what might happen within these areas? As we've seen over the first few weeks of the year, 2024 is already on track to be highly consequential with reverberations far beyond national borders. Today, we want to get ahead of the news cycle by forecasting the stories that we'll likely be talking about in the year ahead. For that, I'm pleased to be joined by top journalists with ample ex expertise in reporting on issues across the region, also with a global eye. And also thrilled today that we're uh, joined by Adrian Arst uh, on the line as well, listening in, Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council and founder of the Adrian Arst Latin America Center. Uh, to Mayor Jordan, let me go ahead and introduce the panelists. Mayor Jordan is a Pulitzer Prize winning correspondent and a former Washington Post co-bureau chief in Tokyo, London, and Mexico City, renowned for her groundbreaking work on the Mexican justice system. Today, she's an associate editor at the Washington Post. Mary, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. We're also delighted to welcome today Luce Meli Reyes. Luce is a Gabby Prize winner and Venezuelan journalist who co-founded Efecto Cocuyo, an independent digital media organization, and Venezuela Migrante, which helps Venezuelan migrants around the world. Thank you very much for being here, Luz Belli. Thank you for having me here. Also joining us is uh, Juan Pablo J.P. Spinetto, winner of the OPEC Award for Public Interest Reporting, former executive producer of Bloomberg TV, and I'll also say in his own words, uh, Bloomberg Opinions columnist following all, following all things Latin America from politics and business to Leo Messi. So maybe I'll ask you about Leo Messi as part of the uh, the conversation today, JP. Uh, it's really great to have you here. Hey, everybody. Ready for a tough conversation on Messi. Fantastic. Michael Stott, Latin America editor of the Financial Times, uh, was slated to join us, but ultimately, as our panelists know, journalists get called away for things at the last moment and uh, is no longer able to join us. However, he very kindly shared some of his predictions of 2024's major events the economic highlights for investors and geopolitical issues affecting the region. So we'll share that in a moment, but first I'd like to remind our audience that they can submit their own questions to our panelists using askac.org, that's A-S-K-A-C.org, or you can do so via the comment section of this live stream or via X by tagging at ACLATAM. But first let me, let's get, let's get started and Turn to Michael's initial five, six minutes of comments on how he sees things shaping up for 2024. So many thanks to Jason and the colleagues at the Atlantic Council for the invitation to join this panel this afternoon. And I'm very sorry I can't be with you in person due to a scheduling conflict, uh, but I wanted to record a few thoughts for you on some of the main questions. As far as the big stories of the year we're looking ahead to, I would say a major one has to be the power of transnational criminal organizations, something I think that's been a little overlooked in the region. There's been a lot of discussion in recent years, understandably, about threats to democracy, a valid topic, but I think it has rather obscured the enormous risks to the region, political risks, uh, social risks, law and order risks from transnational criminal organizations whose power has grown enormously. So I think that's a big theme for the year. I think migration will inevitably be a huge theme with the US election coming up and the enormous numbers coming through the Darien Gap, which are now 
not just Venezuelans or Ecuadorians or Cubans or Nicaraguans, but are also now Chinese, Indians, Pakistanis, Afghans, Africans. Uh, it's becoming a point of migration now for countries from all over the world. Um, and then, of course, on the countryside, the two big elections of the year, Mexico and Venezuela. So the black swan event of the year, um, one obvious black swan event could be a war, another major global conflict, possibly involving China. Uh, that could be one that upsets the calculus. The other, I think, would be something that causes a dramatic shift in commodity prices, to which Latin America, of course, is, is very sensitive. I think those are probably the, the two black swans I'd be thinking about. On the commodities side, it could be an oil price jump or an oil price crash, uh, depending what happens in some of the geopolitical conflicts. It might also be uh, a technological breakthrough on something like uh, batteries, where widespread sodium batteries might uh, cause the bottom to drop out of the lithium market. So something like that, I think, is a, is a possibility for 2024. So investors, I think, this year will be looking very closely at Argentina, where there is an enormous range of possible outcomes from a, an economic revival and a recovery to another economic disaster. Uh, all of those are possible or a sort of uh, mediocre model scenario. Uh, really, anything could happen in Argentina this year. We've got a new government, Javier Millet, uh, with some radical ideas, but actually a more pragmatic start than people had expected. Uh, a lot of rhetoric that investors like, but a very difficult political po position at home and unproven completely in government. So a very volatile mix in Argentina. I think that'll be a major focus for investors. I think investors will also be worrying a bit about Mexico, where uh, a government, the Lopez Obrador government, which was known for fiscal responsibility, has gone on a big spending splurge at the end of the year and started to increase social spending in a way that's going to be quite difficult for future governments to dismantle. There's also enormous exposure to Pemex and the, and the vast debts of Pemex, uh, for which the sovereign is on the hock. So that'll be a worry for investors. Uh, in Brazil, investors are going to be looking closely at what happens to the fiscal balance. The Lula government has been, um, shall we say, has not managed so far to convince investors that it's going to be fiscally responsible. Uh, and this year is going to be, I think, a significant test of that. Um, and on the upside, I suppose, if uh, sanctions relief is continued in Venezuela, which is a big if, uh, and the oil industry continues to revive, we might see quite an interesting economic recovery in Venezuela. And of course, investors who bought Venezuelan debt last year before the sanctions relief uh, did very nicely out of it. On global geopolitics, I think that there's clearly the war angle. So the Ukraine war and what happens on that this year, whether or not that conflict comes to some kind of resolution is going to be important for Latin America. Russia is a major fertilizer supplier to the agricultural nations. Uh, and of course, Russia and Ukraine are big players in the global grains market where Latin America has some important exporters. Um, and that conflict is also a conflict with the potential to move significantly oil and gas prices. Um, the conflict in the Middle East, another one with significant potential to move around energy prices. So that's going to influence the region. Uh, and, and finally, uh, across the straits in Taiwan, whether or not there is some kind of sharper conflict between China and Taiwan following the Taiwanese elections, I think is, is another obvious geopolitical issue that could affect the region. Then one has to say the Trump-Biden uh, election contest in November is going to be very significant for the region, particularly in Mexico. Uh, US elections are often complicated for Mexico, particularly when they coincide with Mexican elections. And we've seen candidates in the US election, uh, some of the Republicans coming out with very harsh language about drug cartels, migration, and what they might do if they're elected. So that, that's going to be watched closely in Mexico. Um, and of course, were Donald Trump to win in November, that's going to be an event with the potential to upend relationships uh, across the region. It would be very good for Javier Millet in Argentina, who's been very close to Trump. It would be a big problem for the likes of Lula and the other left-wing governments down the Andes, Petro in Colombia and Boric in Chile, uh, López Obrador in, in Mexico and his successor, uh, probably Claudia Scheinbaum. So 
there would be a very difficult uh, relationship between those major Latin American nations and the Trump government, I think. Although one has to say that Lopez Obrador and Trump, in fact, uh, got on reasonably well, despite their very different politics. Uh, Claudia Scheinbaum, I suspect, might be a rather different kettle of fish and nowhere near as amenable to a Trump government as Lopez Obrador was. But I think those are probably the major uh, geopolitical issues. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start in the first few weeks of 2024. We've written some really tumultuous developments, such as the declaration of the armed conflict in Ecuador, a turbulent transition of power in Guatemala, uh, legal challenges mark that transition of power, and also unprecedented additional political upheaval. My question for the panelists here is, what other big stories from the region might already be on are already on your radar? What should what should we already be thinking about as we're looking at these critical issues thus far for for 2024? Uh, Marriott, maybe I'll go ahead and start with you. I would say China, China, and China, and you know, particularly you know, its footholds, its money pouring into the Caribbean islands, not just Jamaica, where they have really pumped in a lot of money for loans, but Barbados and other places. And I see, you know, this has been going on now and building up for years. There are Chinese cultural centers popping up in the Caribbean. And right now, when you're talking to Congress, for the first time, I'm starting to hear them really worried about it. You know, it's been building and building and building, and there's just been more action um, and it'll be interesting to see if when there's so much else going on in the world, right, the Middle East, Ukraine, Russia, that if they can keep a focus on this. But I think any time now you hear the word China, especially so close to the U.S., that that is a story. It has been brewing for a long time, but now you can see a couple of Congress members are talking about pumping more money in. And when you have U.S. money going in these islands that are so close to us, but through multilateral organizations, through the World Bank or through IMF, where a lot of people don't even know that that money is flowing from the states, uh, the average person, um, that there is great concern that China, you know, that y the U.S. is not doing what it used to do really well and have soft power so close to our doorstep. So I would think that that is going to be something that, along with all the other stuff that people will be looking at. And Mary, China has really been significantly ramping up its its investment, its interest, its establishment across the region for the for for a, a number a number of years now. But as you look to twenty twenty four, you you see an op, you see the Chinese seeing an opportunity in this year to significantly ramp up even beyond what, what, what has been done in, 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 uh, over the last few years? Well, I, think, I think the new thing is that the U.S. is really, and, and members of Congress are just paying more attention to it. I don't know how much more. I mean, the, the, all expectations are that China will continue this and ramp it up. But in, I think you'll see more action or at least more calls for action, even from Congress, because... You know, China has become a number one worry, even though you have all these other worries. Um, I just haven't heard people on the Hill and at the White House talk about it at this level, even though, as you say, this has been going on for some time. It's an, it's an, it's an, an excellent point. We we actually asked the, the question um, a couple of weeks ago as part of our 2024 predict uh, series of 10 questions. Will more Latin American countries sign up to China's Belt Road Initiative? And we say, yes, more countries will likely sign on this year. Uh, and excellent point on the increased interest from Congress, uh, from the White House. And that'll probably even make, potentially even make its way into the campaign trail as well. And so far as uh, the interest of uh, uh, China's growing interest in the, in the region. Uh, JP, I'd like to get your thoughts. Uh, what other, what, feel free to comment on, on Mary's point on China. Uh, being a, a story for 2024, but uh, what what else might, what else do you see in so far as uh, big stories from the region that, that you're tracking on your radar? Jason, I think this year is we're going to be spoiled by choice um, in reality because we have so many important stories developing in the region, and I'm going to name a few. You know, obviously we have 
the Mexican election. That's going to be pretty consequential. Not so much for who's going to be the winner, but who, what is going to be the political configuration in Mexico um, if, you know, as polls are, um, you know, suggesting Claudia Sheinbaum is the next president of this country. Um, and we're going to have an election in the U.S., right, at the same time. So we're going to have a lot of conversations between what's happening in the U.S., uh, the migration crisis, obviously, um, in the situation with the drugs um, coming in and the violence that this triggers in the in in Latin America, um, so that's one important story. We have the story of Venezuela, right? Are we going to have some election at least? Um, that's I think um, hard to say, and we can we can discuss this more um, as we talk. Uh, we have the G20 in Brazil this year, and we have a very interesting situation developing internally in Brazil, we're going to have Lula trying to make a pitch of um, the global South, um, you know, uh, having more voice in the international arena. But at the same time, Lula is trying to um, uh, expand his mandate internally under his municipal elections in October too. Um, Millet, what is going to happen uh, with his adjustment plan in Argentina? Is he going to be successful or not? Obviously, we started the year with two big stories in Ecuador and Guatemala. Um, these stories will be developing. I think, you know, insecurity is a big theme for uh, Latin America this year. We even have an, a presidential election in Panama, a country that, you know, used to be very stable. And But the situation with this first quantum um, mine reserve uh, and mine project last year showed that um, this clash between the politics and the business in the region, this constant tension, uh, especially when uh, the region expl exploits natural resources, is there all the time, even in countries that were supposed to be very uh, legally secure, if you want, in terms of the jurisdiction. So a lot of topics, uh, I think we're going to be able to discuss them uh, along this hour. But um, as I said, there is a lot of topics that are part of the agenda this year. JB, let me follow up with you. So Mexican election, Venezuela election, G20, Malay, Ecuador, Guatemala. Of those topics... I'm, I'm Bukele. I'm, I'm forgetting about the election in <laughs> El Salvador. Election, which, election El Salvador. It's a foregone conclusion, obviously, right? But I think in this context of what's going on in Ecuador, Bukele's stock, if you want, is not, it's only going up. Yeah. Looking at those issues, JP, where do you where where do you think we might see a surprise? Right, where do you where do you um, where do you expect kind of the, the expected as we've seen the first few uh, you know weeks of the year? You know, uh, you know Guatemala, the 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 the, the political challenges uh, that we've seen in the first few weeks of the year and only continuing after the inauguration. Obviously, the the uh, uh, the internal armed conflicts now being declared in Ecuador and the continued security situation. So there's certain certain stories that we probably can anticipate will continue to unfold as we've started to see them unfold, but there will also be certain stories that might take a different direction. Where do you yeah. see potential different direction and some of the issues you raised? All right. Okay. So in terms of what, what can be a surprise, I think the least surprising thing is that Venezuela is not going to have a free and fair election. I think that's, that's pretty clear. Now, my question is, what is going to be the format that Maduro will choose to avoid having that free and fair election uh, when a few months ago cut a deal with the Biden administration. I think that's a big question mark, right? It can be um, at this point anything between suspending the election and invading uh, Guyana or you know having some sort of facade election that can keep him carry on for a few more years, right? So I think this is a big non and non if you want. Um, uh, if we try to to see what's going on and what what can happen this year, then in Mexico, um, I think it's not so surprising that Claudia Sheinbaum could retain power for the Morena party that's currently in office. But I think a lot will happen in this election. I think it's a mistake to underestimate this election. I think people are saying this is a, a an election that is already decided. Are looking very closely at how important. This election is, um, especially for the U.S., that, as, as I said, will have um, an election a few months later, especially if Trump comes back, right? But even if you look at the domestic politics, it's not the same to have Morena retaining power uh, with five points of difference with the opposition uh, in the presidential race 
or having 25, as some polls are showing now. It's not the same to have a constitutional um, supermajority in Congress in Mexico that will allow Claudia Sheinbaum to effectively change the constitution as much as she wanted, or having um, a poor election and a very competitive and, and divided Congress for the next six years. It's not the same if Morena wins losing uh, the, the Mexico City government or winning it. Yeah. So I think there is a lot of question marks there in Mexico. And finally, Millet, uh, how is going to turn out? I don't know. I think he has a path. And I think this is going to be something very surprising this year if he can finally uh, tame the inflation in Argentina. Thanks, JP. And, and also we're talking about where there might be surprises among the expected events. You can always go to Venezuela where you're going to expect some kind of some kind of surprise in so far as how Maduro is going to uh, navigate a, a, a consequential year. Very good points on, on on Mexico and Argentina as well. Let me go to to to, uh, to Luz um, and Luz. Let me start with this, and then we'll dig deeper into Mexico and, and Venezuela. And Mary, I want to dig dig deeper on Mexico Mexico with you and Luz on Venezuela with you. Um, but let me start off, uh, Luz, on your thoughts on big stories that you're thinking about for the year. And what are some of those big stories that, that are on your radar? And maybe how might they be, how might you be thinking now about them in a way that maybe others might not be thinking about how those stories might transpire? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think there are there are two big stories that are connected to the political processes of Latin American countries. Uh, for example, elections in different countries from El Salvador to Venezuela. I uh, I believe firmly that. In Venezuela, we are going to have election. We don't know where, when, but we are going to have it. Um, also, I think that we have to see the impact that the presidential election of the USA will have on the country of the, the region. No? The start of the region for me seems to, uh, to be Guatemala because the inauguration of President Arevalo has filled his population with hope and can be an example for the region that flares with uh, authoritarianism. I mean, uh, I think that we had to look for more stories about how the people who believe in democracy can do, uh, ca can change the story uh, and instead to spend a, a lot of time complaining about democracy, for example. I think there is a point that maybe from the USA, always don't, don't pay the same attention that we are doing right now. There is like mm, the migration of people from the South to the North. Uh, I think it's a process that does not stop. Uh, um, every country where uh, people is going, uh, is, is, is working, they have uh, an internal uh, impact. 75% in uh, the, of people who go through the Darien Gap they were Venezuelan people, but they are not coming from Venezuela. So there is something that uh, called my attention because there are, maybe some of them are coming from countries like Ecuador, Peru, Colombia. And I think in those countries, there's a lot of problems that we are not seeing in, in a very well right now. So I think the process of people coming from the south to the north uh, is going to be uh, a, a, a real situation that we have to manage as a journalist, but also the authority uh, of the countries and even in the state, for example, in cities like New York City or Chicago. Very good points, Luz. And, and also looking at some of the hemispheric events, uh, we were we were talking earlier about you know Ecuador as a security situation. Ecuador um, continued to deteriorate, and why it's so important uh, the uh, uh, U.S. support for Ecuador at, at this at this critical moment uh, that just leads to more outward flow of of, uh, of, of migrants. Um, the uh, um, let me go, before digging into individual countries, I like to ask this question: Think about uh, a black swan event, and for those who are less familiar with the term, a black swan event is a is an unforeseen event. Uh, we've uh, unpredictable event. Uh, we've been talking about the events thus far that that have been foreseen for the era, um, whether it's whether it's uh, increased interest from China or elections in different countries or 
uh, increased migratory flows, uh, the G20, uh, whether Malay will be successful in his economic reform proposals in, in Argentina. Um, but where should our audience be focusing on for a potential surprise? What what uh, what might happen this over the course of this year that nobody we might not be talking about the uh, the, um, um, the, uh, the 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 unknown. Maybe I'll start with you, with you, Mary. What, what do you think? I think um, AI. Um, we just saw this afternoon that the New Hampshire Attorney General is investigating um, fake robocalls that were supposedly made by Joe Biden to voters across New Hampshire right ahead of the primary, where he says this fake voice um, says in, in Joe Biden's voice, don't come out and vote don't vote. This is the number one concern. It was huge in Davos in the last few days. Of the use of disinformation, misinformation, robocalls, um, and, and how AI, gen artificial intelligence generated messages, audio images, images that are showing, for instance, that Putin is using these. He has U.S. celebrities superimposed you know, on, you know, Russian things that say that these very popular figures um, are for Putin. This is the head of the election. So I think that we don't know yet uh, how people are going to fake news uh, and use kind of artificial intelligence to mess with the system. And I think it's pretty scary, actually. But I, and how we're going to be able to quickly counter it, especially if it comes in at the last minute before people go to the polls. Uh, in, you know, it, it's very hard to tell sometimes what's real and what's not real. So I think that the big concern, and maybe it's not yet on people's radar, but it's going to be. Um, when I saw that news again today, it's, you know, it's, it's in New Hampshire. It's going to be everywhere before yeah. this year is out. Yeah, you know, and we've seen we've seen across the region that misinformation, disinformation in the U.S. context that also plays itself out in the, in the Latin American Caribbean context as well, right? We've seen. Uh, no, I'm saying that this is going to happen in these countries. It's going to be in Mexico. It's going to be wherever there's elections. It's going to be used in Venezuela. It's going to be used in El Salvador. It is, you know, I'm just saying that that it's it's just it. We're just seeing it. Um, and I don't know where it's going to go and how it's going to play into these elections that are pretty pivotal throughout Latin America. Mary, Mary's an excellent point. We, we've been doing monitoring of misinformation, disinformation. We do it from the Atlantic Council from our Digital Forensics Research Lab. And, uh, um, and, and the, the specifically looking at the, the Venezuelan context, uh, also the last cycle in Mexico, even the 2018 election in Mexico, we saw a lot of misinformation, disinformation. That was six years ago. And you look at right. how, that's, how that's advanced uh, over the course uh, from 2018 to, to 2024. So, um, uh, and, and, and we've also seen um, Russia specifically taking advantage of the information environment in the, in the hemisphere uh, and uh, uh, using that to try to uh, scuttle elections and scuttle kind of the, the democratic process uh, whenever possible. So I, I, uh, I think that's absolutely an essential point that you're raising. Um, let me go, Luce, Luce, what do you, what do you, so um, misinformation, disinformation, AI, and how that, how that could potentially dominate part, parts of the, um, the way elect, elections are carried out in the hemisphere this year. Uh, Luce, what do you, what do you see as a, potential unforeseen, unpredictable, a black swan event of, of 2024. Okay, I totally agree with what you're talking about, uh, this information, misinformation, and uh, artificial intelligence, but I would like to add uh, the criminal governance uh, in our uh, countries, because what happened in Ecuador, it could be happen in, uh, other countries and we are not seeing what is happening there. So when they try to control the situation in Ecuador, the criminals are going to move to other places. And we are, we have a, a, a lot of countries with a very unstable system. And then if we see, for example, that Bukele is going to win the election in uh, El Salvador, for example, Maybe we are going to to see also a clash of the uh, people 
who try to control from the government the crime with um, violation of human rights. So I think we are going to manage uh, the the situation between people who is going to support this kind of a uh, 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 government and uh, the criminal that they are going to organize also uh, about how they are going to work during uh, uh, throughout the region, through, for example, the uh, the traffic of, of people, traffic of uh, drugs, and this kind of thing, because they are going to use also the artificial intelligence. I think so. There is the the, mis the mystery that I can see that it could be happening in our region. Thanks, Luz. I think that's incredible, incredibly important, especially as you're seeing what we're seeing in, in, in El Salvador and, and kind of how people are kind of looking at kind of what's happening in El Salvador and trying to maybe emulate it in, in other, other contexts as, as security is really dominating the, the agendas of citizens across the hemisphere. JP, what do you think? Um, so um, I think Luz read my mind in terms of a hot topic that may happen, and which is the violence, right? And we saw what happened tragically last year in Ecuador with the killing of Fernando Villavicencio, right? Um, in Mexico's election, in the last election in 2018, uh, more than 100 politicians were killed, right? Between candidates, former officials, you know, people in um, in office. And, and election cycles are very violent in Latin America, as we saw. I think, you know, obviously I'm not forecasting anything, but I think we should pay a lot of attention in the mix and the linkages between organized crime, violence, drug trafficking, and politics, uh, which t is is as we as we've been seeing daily, um, a very important point and a very important topic. And as Luz um, is saying rightly, um, you know, we need some sort of regional approach because even if Ecuador is successful, um, if uh, President Oboa manages to calm down the situation, bring down um, killings and all of that. These, these groups, which are organized crime, you know, they're very sophisticated. They're going to move around the region. This is not going to end, right? So we need some sort of approach uh, from that side. Now, you asked me about Black Swan, and Black Swan is something that, in theory, we didn't think it could happen, and it didn't happen. So I don't know. I'm not very sure if this is an example, we we know these are hot topics, right? But I, I'm gonna mention something that uh, I think it's it's starting to, to worry a bit, which is um, the fiscal situation in Brazil, right? People are not paying close attention um, so much, but um, we see President Lula trying to speed on with his, um, with his plan. Um, there is his finance minister trying to or pledging that they're going to get to a fiscal zero deficit this this year. And this is, you know, primary deficit. If you take the total deficit in Brazil, it's close to 8% of GDP. So clearly the fiscal situation in Brazil, it's something that it could develop into, um, into a problem if it's not addressed. And there are big question marks if President Lula wants to address it or not. So I think we should pay a lot of attention to, to that because the chances that in the end, he pushes on with his Lulanomic style and and wants to spend more and more to try to um, have his base happy and the economy growing, in the end could be um, hurt by um, markets that says, put a, put a limit saying you can go further. Remember that Brazil has a quite a significant debt to GDP ratio and, and something has to give. So I'll, I'll go for that one too. Fantastic. I want to ask maybe uh, get, get individual questions. I want to ask two follow-up questions. One is, um, uh, rarely do we have a conversation about what might happen in, in the region, uh, looking ahead, and uh, and uh, and the work in Cuba hasn't been mentioned uh, thus far, um, and uh, maybe that means that uh, um, there's uh, th there's many other things that are happening in the region, but also the situation in Cuba has uh, become more and more worrisome for the Cuban people uh, uh, just, you know, even, even just recently, even just in the last few months. Uh, why, might, might we see some type of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of change in Cuba, some type of, of, of whether, it, whether it's from the, the Cuban government, whether it's kind of new 
uh, protests rising up from the from the Cuban people, or or just the overall economic situation, even the the alignment of of Cuba. Uh, I mean, do we is 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 do we is, is there, might be there be a, a Cuba story for twenty twenty four that we're not yet talking about? Um, I'm pretty sure Luz knows more than me on the topic, but I would say that uh, there's always a Cuba story to to be written. Uh, the problem is what is next, right? We know by some calculations, 4% of the population left last year migrated somehow to uh, Nicaragua, then tried to get into the US. And, but, um, you know, that's tragic. Now, what is the political impact of all of that? We see the political, the impact in the US, but we don't see in Cuba, right? Now, something has to give. We've been talking about, you know, regime change for, years, decade now, and it's not happening, I wouldn't bet that it's going to happen this year. Maybe it's just saying it is a guarantee that it will happen. Uh, but um, uh, I would say, you know, it's it's right. And I totally agree, Jason, that, you know, we're not talking about this uh, enough. And in the prospect of a Trump presidency in, in the U.S. makes it even um, more complicated ahead, right? So let's get your thoughts. And then, Mary, I want to go back to you. There's actually a question in the, I'll go back to you on the disinformation uh, you were, that you raised previously, but let's first get Luz's thoughts on, on Cuba. Uh, I think for, uh, we, we have this uh, danger of forgotten crisis, like a Cuba, as you say, and Nicaragua. But uh, I think Cuba could play a new role in Latin America. Why? Because, you know, Cuba is very close to Guyana, and Guyana is exploding, it's exploding oil, and Guyana is going to, to, to raise a lot of money or a lot of resources, and then Cuba is very close with, with, with Guyana. And then there is another question that somebody in Washington told me that maybe it could be a change in, in the state. So Cuba is maybe we we'll try to 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 make some deals with Biden administration before the change of government. I don't know what is going to happen in the state, but I think Cuba is going is going to play a different role in overall uh, Latin America. Mary, I'm, I'm gonna. I want to. There's a question in the. Uh, and, and again, if you have a question, you're watching. You can submit your question via askac.org. Uh, or uh, via X, uh, use the hash uh, the the, uh, the handle at directed to the handle at AC Lanham. But Mary, there's a question following up on the conversation we we're having earlier about disinformation and artificial intelligence um, uh, from uh, from Rebecca here, uh, which is asking how are how are countries in the region addressing the challenge of AI dri driven disinformation? Uh, are they behind the curve? What, what else? And also maybe even more broadly, what else could be done? Uh, to yes. be to better address uh, AI to better address disinformation during electoral cycles. This is the key question. Um, yes, behind the curve. I mean, America's behind the curve. The United States is behind the curve. Um, we don't even know how yet. I mean, e even in our own newsroom, we are we have experts now that are trying to say okay, that can tell you that this is a fake uh, image. So if Putin, you know, has, uh, you know, the most popular star in Hollywood next to him saying, you know, with his arm around him, you know, we have experts that can say that. And I'm, sh and all, I'm sure that the governments there are doing this. And there's all kinds of, you know, Mexico has a, an election commission looking at it, all the countries in Latin America do, uh, but they have to get up to speed really fast. And this technology is developing like crazy. It is going uh, you know, it's always been the way that technology it, uh, moves way faster than any regulations or kind of catch up. So I think that's why there is so much alarm about it. And with Mexico specifically, the hottest issue is the migration, right? As Luce was saying, the Darien Gap, some estimates are that a half a million migrants have come through there in Panama. A half a million um, it is the single biggest issue at a Trump rally. I spent a, way too much time at Trump rallies. And that is what drives people. So 
every single election in Mexico, it's a, this what they're going to do with this migrant flow. What are we going to do is huge. There was news today with the foreign minister of Mexico announcing some new agreements. Guatemala, Mexican and U.S. officials met. And one of the things they're doing, for instance, is they're going to have instead of Guatemalans and people from other Latin American countries having to go to the U.S.-Mexico border to apply for asylum, there's big push now to use this app uh, where you could apply for asylum in place way further south of the border. You know, already people are talking about hacking into that and how you can use artificial intelligence to do all kinds of weird things with that. It is really kind of quite scary. Um, but I, and I think that you're going to see a lot of distorted and misinformation about migration and immigration. Mexico seems that even though the Biden administration, Mexico have not really solved, you know, or made progress towards this, the, the looming pro, pro, um, President, the possible presidents of Trump has all of a sudden, you know, really put this on sped up. We got to get something done because the number one thing driving Trump supporters is control of that border. And I think the Mexican officials get better, better the devil, you know, the devil, you, well, you, you do know the devil in Trump. But there is, I think that this looming prospect that Trump could be reelected is re-energizing a lot of effort to get some of these problems done, like migration. What are we going to do about human smuggling? Uh, what are we going to do about gang violence? The violence thing is massive that everybody's mentioned here. And and I back to the AI, I think on all these key issues, you're going to see people wanting to mess with the system and, and throwing out bad information about what's really happening. If there is progress made, they'll say there's no progress made. Um, if there is a little violence, they'll say there's more violence. And I think that it's something that news organizations, every NGO, every election commission throughout the region, um, and anybody who cares has got to pay attention to because, you know, democracy only, you know, survives on facts. And I think this is, Nothing could be more critical. I couldn't agree more. You know, there was, as, as you referenced, Mary, there are the, the the bilateral talks in Washington D.C. this this past Friday, and right. uh, and uh, and as, as you mentioned, uh, Secretary Barson uh, uh, made clear today in a, in a press briefing some of the, the the points that were inside those talks go into specifically to, to your point, right? Uh, uh, a, a plan to ramp up deportation flights to to different countries uh, in exchange for with with also development assistance and also uh, sharing information uh, with regard to sanctioning firms transporting migrants. So there's there's a, a, a huge and that followed a, a December conversation as well between the U.S. and Mexican officials. So a huge push, and, and I think you know that goes actually. Uh, I want to ask you another question about Mexico. Then I want to bring in a question from the. Um, from the, we got via askac.org, which is how do you foresee foreign policy toward lack changing with either a Trump uh, administ Trump election or a or a Biden re-election in uh, in November? But Mary, let me first. Um, I didn't get a chance to ask you. And you've, you 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 know Mexico well. Uh, if you had additional comments on how you see the. Uh, uh, the election taking place and taking shape in Mexico. JP made uh, some uh, comments originally, uh, but Mexicans are going to head to the polls, uh, most likely electing the first female president of, of Mexico. Um, and even though the uh, uh, even the, even though the, the the race might not seem as tight as as, as uh, uh, you know as 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 as, as maybe previous contests. Uh, there still was a, there still was a lot of questions going into into this election. Lots of key issues from, from trade to migration to the border, um, and so you know how do you how do you, what are your scenarios of how you see this incredibly consequential election in Mexico shaping the the bilateral uh, relationship? Well, I think he was dead on when he said the key thing here is it's not just a presidential election, but the federal Congress is up. And, you know, the, the key post of Mexico City is up, along with all these other local uh, elections. 
and 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 how how big of a margin is going to be is going to be key. And I think it's still too early. Just it is too early to know what's going to happen between what looks like a Biden Trump matchup. But the the strength of the party, um, you know, there's always a chance that Claudia shine. I mean, the polls suggest she's going to win, but there there could be all kinds of missteps yet. Um, I think there is clearly a big effort now to get some work done because that you know we, we've, we've seen these migrant camps all of a sudden the Mexican army is out on the border um, trying to clear these camps that's making Washington happy but Washington is going to have to make Mexico happy um, right. and what are they going to do and how much money are they going to give and if Biden does give what what seems to be brewing here is more financial support because he's pretty darn aware that he needs to solve this border problem if he wants to get reelected. And that could be really good for her. And she could get a big bump by somehow uh, being seen as, you know, that he can, she can work with Washington. She can get more money out of it. She can solve this problem because Mexico has been hurt terribly by all the, all the migrants coming from other countries through their country. I also think that there is a really fascinating thing that the Mexican government has done that I don't think a lot of people have paid attention to is they have sued in federal court American gun makers, right? They have sued all the big gun makers saying that their guns are going down by the boatload. I mean, it is incredible the number of U.S. made guns guns that cross down into the border and kill enormous number of people. And they're causing this violence and and the cartels. And some of them grossly um, are even being made with gold plated, you know, um, signias on them that specifically appeal to cartel owners. And that is getting a little bit more traction because there's a law in the U.S. that shields, if, if I want to sue a gun maker, very hard to do an American suing an American gun maker because of laws that shield them from misuse that if they fall into the hands of criminals. But this is kind of new territory to have a foreign government sue. And uh, I think that at the very least, it's going to get a lot of um, much needed attention to the fact that it is American guns causing such carnage down in Mexico. Um, and I, I think all of that is, you know, they did, people in Latin America want America want the United States to recognize their role in in some of these big problems, and and then once you do that, you can begin to address some ways to fix it. Yeah, uh, excellent points. You know, the U.S. role long long time concerns about U.S. seeking to. Uh, curtail drug supply, but not doing much on the U.S. and to reduce the drug demand that comes out, that comes with this country that, that fuels the drug supply. And right. similar to what you're saying on, on, on the arms, I think the stats are what, upwards of 80 percent of of, of, um, of arms in Mexico. I think they'll be even higher come from come from the uh, come from the U.S. And you look at the maps of major gun uh, stores in Texas and they're right on highways that lead right into Mexico. Um, uh, uh, th th there was a question from Alexander here about how do you foresee a policy, U.S. foreign policy toward the region changing in either a Trump or a Biden administration? And um, uh, it, frankly, it's, it's a little easier to answer in some ways than, than other contests because uh, the, the the two likely nominees uh, have both uh, both have served in the White House. Uh, so we, we know a little bit of, of how both uh, uh, both uh, uh, likely candidates uh, will uh, you know would would uh, would potentially govern based on on precedent? Uh, but let me turn to you, um, whoever, maybe JP. I'll turn turn to you first on this one. Yeah, totally. I mean, we know both of them, right? We know their policies from these last four years or the previous four years. I think you know the big difference is with Trump, you're gonna get a much more transactional foreign policy, whereas with Biden and and the Democrats, you you see a more procedural, if you want, um, relationship, right? And it, that that that's sort of really interesting because um, the focus on process is sometimes um, uh, to maybe to to the surprise of some uh, um, 
you know, Latin American leaders are really very accustomed to that and they may get frustrated and they prefer a more transactional approach like what you, you got with Trump, right? And uh, I think in any case, uh, big if, right? Trump wins, um, hotspot will be Mexico for sure. Now we're gonna, we, are, we don't have AMLO now. Um, he finishes his term on uh, end of September. So whoever wins the presidency will have to face a new president. And I think the key thing that we need to start paying attention, is not now, right? It's not a topic for 2024, but the review of the USMCA comes due in 2026, right? And for sure, if Trump wins, uh, he's going to start agitating with the need of changing that, um, that deal. Uh, even though he signed the deal um, back in 2018, right? But um, just the prospect of trying to score a political win by saying the neighbors, I, extract, I extracted more um, out of that deal will be tempting enough, I think, for Trump to to agitate with that. Even during the campaign, I didn't, uh, he hasn't said it yet, but maybe maybe he started looking at that. Um, and the other thing is that, again, we're going to see this, this thing that really personally depresses me a lot, which is foreign policy. Um, as if it was some sort of football or baseball game where, you know, depending on your team, you side with one or not the other, right? So we're going to have now, if Trump wins, we're going to have now rocky relationship again with Brazil because Lula is there and a good relationship with Argentina because Mila is there, right? And, and you know, even if it's politics, you know, and the nature of um, the world we live in, I think that's that's a bit sad because in the end, countries should collaborate and governments have the duty to try to um, find solutions to all these topics, regardless of their in ideological you know, uh, base. Thanks, thanks, JP, uh, and and thanks for raising the USMC. That's a great a great point. Uh, Luce, what what are you, what are your thoughts? Okay, um, I was thinking about talk about Venezuela, no. Uh, uh, Jason. Yeah, and also maybe maybe Venezuela, also maybe in the context of uh, even Alexander's question here about how could Venezuela this year, but also how could policy, what also what does that mean with either a, uh, 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 if, if it's a, a Trump administration uh, that, uh, that takes office in 2025, or if it's a, a second Biden administration? Well, uh, uh, I'm not sure what is going to happen in, here in the state. But what I, I, I think it, it would be very important in a, in the case of Venezuela is the result of the election here in the state. That is the reason that in Venezuela, Maduro is like a, dealing with a lot of things and thinking about how he's going to manage the relation in, in any case, the situation changed in the state or uh, even the uh, Biden continue uh, 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 in the power how they are going to to do after April, uh, you know, because the the Venezuela government signed an agree in Barbados um, showing that they are going to call for election uh, in this year, maybe the second term of the year. So I think the, the main player continue uh, to be the United States because the in the case of Venezuela, uh, Especially the government, the Maduro government, depend on what happens. Uh, what is going to happen here in the state? I I, I don't know if it, it was the, the 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 question, but I think that we can we can find the connection. What is happening here and uh, what well, what is happening in the state? Uh, the thing that could happen in our country. It's a, a great great point. We have about five five minutes left. Uh, Mira, I'd like to give give you the opportunity to ask, ask answer the the, the Biden Trump question, but I also want to give you give you an opportunity to address. We always try to look at the importance of Latin America and the Caribbean from a broader global perspective, uh, and uh, given given that hat that you wear as well, I also want to throw out a question to you: of How do you see global geopolitical issues uh, influencing the region this year? You've already talked about uh, China. We've talked about um, uh, we talked about disinformation in the Russian context. But as we've just seen over the course of the, of the fall, uh, the uh, Israel-Hamas uh, war has had implications in, in, in Latin America, uh, as have other other global events. So 
give you an opportunity to address the Trump Biden if you want if you want to take that question on as well. But then also, how do you see uh, broader global geopolitical issues? Then, then JP, I'm going to go to you on the last question, just from an investor perspective. Where do you think investors sh should be looking at going going into the year? I, I think if it were not um, the U.S. election this year, that because the Middle East is such a huge and growing problem. I mean, there is real concern over there that that, is, that war is widening, that all it's going to take is, um, God forbid, a missile hit on U.S. soldiers. The U.S. is going to get involved. We're already in Yemen. I mean, that war looks bad. It looks like it's going to get worse and wider. And then, of course, you have the massive uh, Russia, Ukraine. If it were not for the U.S. election, I think that Latin America would not be as high on the radar as it is. But because immigration and the and the the flow, the border is absolutely key. You can, I mean, we are going to see every ad from Donald Trump talking about the border. And in addition to the border issues, immigration issues, and the key to solving some of these really difficult problems. Um, they're, both sides want to do it. Everyone wants to do it now. Um, then you also have this kind of growing China problem in the region so close to us. Even in Cuba, China's there. Every time you turn around, they're building a road. They're, they're giving money for a bridge. And most scarily, they're giving money for ports. Well, what we saw happen when China lent money to Sri Lanka for a port was when they couldn't repay the debt. All of a sudden, China owned the port. So I think that in this incredible time of turmoil, in normal times, if there is such a thing as a normal time, with these huge fires elsewhere in the world, you wouldn't see the attention Latin America is going to get. But I think they are going to get more, chiefly because of the election and also because of the worry about China. Uh, excellent points. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, the uh, JP, let me let me go to you on uh, from investor perspective. Uh, we have uh, Brazil forecasted better than expected three percent growth uh, hit last year. We talked a little bit about Guyana and its economic um, boom due to the oil and gas industry. Uh, we talked about Argentina uh, economic policies reeling after a year of of, of over two hundred percent. Uh, inflation, December, had the highest uh, percentage increase in consumer price index in three decades, I believe, in Argentina. Uh, S&P predicts the region has exhausted its post-pandemic economic recovery. Where do you think investors will be looking or where should, invest, where should investors be looking uh, in, in the year ahead? Yeah, totally. And let me say that it's a shame Michael is not with us in the end because he wrote a really good piece that you guys should read about you know, the optimist case for Latin America. And and I couldn't agree more with him, uh, with the fact that this world, complicated as it is, um, it's an opportunity for Latin America, but we we'll have to see if we get the policies right to to take advantage of this. Uh, having said that, you know, the expectations, as you, as you say, is that the economy will slow this year as a, as a, as a whole. Uh, probably from 2.2 2 .2 for something like 1.9. I'm personally a bit more optimistic. I think Brazil and, and Mexico will continue driving growth. But from an investor perspective, there I would say there are three hot issues. First, uh, what I mentioned before about Lula and Lulanomics, right? If Brazil, this, this tension between uh, what Lula wants to achieve in Brazil and what investors are willing to finance. Right and how much that growing fiscal deficit of Brazil can be tolerated by in investors. The second point is Millet, right? And if he manages to bring down inflation currently above two hundred percent, and I think he has a path. It's going to be complicated. It can go wrong, but I think uh, if he continues with that fiscal adjustment and brings down the fiscal deficit, markets will will, will reward him. Right, and that's clearly something that investors are looking at very closely because it's a very difficult road, as I said, and you know the the success is not there yet. Uh, and I will say the third point is Pemex, right? Something that we haven't spoke to, 
yet, uh, spoke about yet, but um, the company has over $100 billion in debt. It's the most indebted oil company in the world. And we don't know what Claudia Sheinbaum will do with the company if she wins Mexico's presidency. I think, you know, that's a very hot issue for investors this year. Wonderful. Thank you, JP. Uh, Mary, I want to, you, you made an excellent comment beforehand, um, which is the counterfactual. It rarely does Latin America, the, Latin America get uh, attention in an, in, in an, an elect, in a, in a time in which there is so much going on on a global stage. But as you say, precisely because of the U.S. election, uh, there will be maybe specific issues within the region uh, that will be that will be uh, that will be uh, uh, focused focused on uh, as part of the, uh, the U.S. campaign. Um, I think one clear takeaway from this conversation, and I want to thank uh, Juan Pablo Spinetto, Mary Jordan, Luz Melly Reyes for joining us for the last uh, hour. Uh, unfortunately, Michael Stock couldn't uh, join, but uh, his comments will be available on the recording of this conversation. Uh, is that one thing is clear is that we at the Asian Arts Latin America Center have our work cut out for us this year. Uh, we have a very busy year ahead. Uh, there are so many pressing issues, uh, critical issues um, to be able to wrap our heads about, to be able to think about in a different way, to be able to bring the right actors together to, to uh, come up with solutions at a highly charged uh, moment. And uh, we always like doing so in a, in a nonpartisan uh, way. So uh, thank you again to um, Juan Pop, to all three of you for joining us speakers. Uh, uh, Adrian Arts was on on the whole time li listening in, so great she could she could join us. And thanks to the, our our many other guests uh, as we look at what will be a highly consequential year for 2024. So buckle your seatbelts, and uh, the first few weeks of the year have already been quite uh, dramatic. So we'll, let's see what happens over the course of the next few weeks, months, and over the course of the year. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks.